If anyone wants to stand up who's on the floor quickly and just do a little bit of mic movement, if you feel like you need to wiggle, and I'll just get rid of my nervous energy. Um, and I'll start. Pablo, you on? So, 10 years ago, I came to understand that health and wellness was about so much more than food and fitness. Right now in the West, we are beginning, finally, to understand that the new health rules are actually the old ones. We're moving away from a very linear, formulaic, tick-box approach to something a lot more holistic, which comes from the word whole, or a 360 view, if you like. It is, after all, how we approach our life in our day-to-day -day that is the healthcare that we need to focus on, as much as, if not more so, than the disease management system that we've got in place. For now, though, as you can see, well-being is big business. It's in fashion, and it's here to stay. But what is the magic formula for health? Despite the huge technological, scientific, surgical advances, we live in a health endemic of lifestyle disease. Burnout is rife, mental health issues are on the rise, the hospitals are packed out, government policies are outdated, and well-being is marketed at the elite. While nutritional science is constantly being debated. Wellness is a landscape of confusion. In the modern world, we have deviated from the biological norm. We've forgotten how to eat and sleep. We find it difficult to sit without a chair. We don't breathe properly, like I'm doing now. We can't wait without scrolling, without checking our phones. We can't poo without a coffee, right? Or it's just flying straight through us all day and every day. Our rituals are based around addictions rather than recharging and respecting ourselves. We're not living. We're just high-functioning, surviving on adrenaline and the buzz of technology. Though scientists the world over are trying to nail the formula for health and well-being, the magic pill, the truth is, the one-size-fits-all approach doesn't work. There is no quick fix. There's no shortcut. Life doesn't have a magic formula for health. Life ebbs and flows. It's complex and it's subtle, and that's the beauty of it. But there are simple pointers to make our lives easier to navigate, and guess what? They're thousands of years old. Well-being is coming full circle, and it's coming back to nature, because, of course, we are nature and we are of nature. This is what the ancient systems of health are based on and which modern science is beginning to validate right now. So it's very exciting times. And the well-being trends that we're currently witnessing are actually traditional concepts of well-being that are thousands of years old. In fact, we can go two and a half thousand years back to Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine, with these ancient quotes that are so relevant today. Let food be thy medicine, and medicine be thy food. All disease begins in the gut. The gut, right? We keep hearing about that now, like it's new. We're just catching up with that. In fact, this was said 460 years BC, and we're just talking about it now. And we can go even further back, some three to 5,000 years, to Ayurveda, one of the oldest health systems, if not the oldest health system. It's the mother of natural medicine. So what's Ayurveda? Well, Ayu means life, and Veda means knowledge. So life knowledge, or the science of life. Oh, go back one, please, Pablo. It's 5,000-year-old holistic system from India that empowers us as individuals to understand how we are constantly ebbing and flowing, as is life itself, that we are nature and can be supported by nature. It gives us the framework and vocabulary to understand and express what's going on in and around us, and is still traditionally used in India and Sri Lanka today. Ayurveda is born from the same civilization as yoga, and to be a yogi is to put the knowledge of life or Ayurveda into practice in your every day. This is tried and tested stuff. They figured it out before science figured it out. Meanwhile, let's segue to some modern trends in health. Almond milk, energy balls, the turmeric latte or turmeric everything, right? Herbalism, meditation, soaking and sprouting, fermentation, bone broth, slow cooking, homeopathy, Probiotics, prebiotics, juices and tonics, digestion, tongue scraping, circadian rhythm, oil pulling, acupuncture, massage, yoga, am I on track? Track, chakras and mantras, supplements, enemas, pranayama or breath work, mindfulness, intermittent fasting. It's all Ayurveda, baby.
These trends are deeply rooted in the science of Ayurveda, but they are just aspects. They need to be kept in context. We can't overdo them. For example, avocados, the pinup of the well-being revolution. Uh, that slide is in the wrong place, sorry. They're not going to save the world. <laughs> Green juice, it's not a long-term solution. Sauerkraut, too much, and you've got more than a win problem. <laughs> Why in the West do we think more is more, right? Ginger shot, I'll have five ginger shots. We need to understand that the dose makes the medicine or the poison. It's all about balance. That really bloody boring B word. We're addicted to drama and extremes and highs, which, by the way, create lows. But creating balance is the art of living well. Ayurveda is all about finding your balance, your groove, your flow. After all, we can't control our world because the only constant, the only thing that we can be absolutely certain of is change. So we need to be equipped to ride it. So what is balance? It's certainly not perfectionism. It's actually that sweet spot that we should aim for in our day-to-day, -day, where you feel A-OK, -okay, centered, that feel-good feeling in and of yourself, where your resources and reserves can sustain the challenges and activities you face in your day-to-day. -day. If you're constantly tired, feeling reactive, feeling challenged, then you need to work on increasing your resources and decreasing your challenges or how you react to those challenges. In this modern world full of conveniences, full of time savers, we're time poor, right? We're stressed. We're definitely overstimulated. I am massively overstimulated right now. <laughs> but we think we're doing a great job with our intense exercise, coffee highs, I'm going for it again, beating the traffic, laundry, chores, devices, TV, podcasts, messages, emails, shopping, socializing, alcohol, family, commuting, late night dinners, and then juicing and yo-yo dieting. Even though we have so much, we have so much compared to everybody else, all this materialism, we've lost connection to source, to who we are. We can formulate, we can make rules, we can get an app to work it out, when I should I go to sleep, when should I get up? But the problem is, we no longer know how to honor the basic needs of sleep, rest, which by the way is different to sleep, and digestion. The modern world forgot to value this, the yin energy of being, that feminine energy. It's not really about gender, it's more like the yin and the yang. We are both, but we forgot the yin. We forgot the yin of being, it's all about the yang of doing. We've forgotten how to be human beings, only human doings. So whenever I lose my way, which is quite often, I love to come back to this quote which puts things into perspective for me. When the Dalai Lama was asked what surprised him the most about humanity, he replied, man. Because he sacrifices his health in order to make money, then he sacrifices money to recuperate his health. Sounds absolutely nuts, right? And then he's so anxious about the future that he does not enjoy the present. The result being that he does not live in the present or the future. He lives as if he is never going to die, and then he dies having never really lived. I know, it doesn't end there, I carry on. Sounds familiar. Okay, so what can Ayurveda teach us? We're intrinsically connected to the world around us. There's all the elements that we talk about in Ayurveda there. We have gut feelings, we talk about good vibes, that's in our language, it exists. As humans, we're always trying to conquer nature and when we do this, we overlook ourselves. If we do not strive for full awareness of our inner world, then how can we respect our outer world? Is it any wonder that we have allowed the destruction of our planet and exploitation of others through our consumerism? If we don't honor nature and our own nature, we're just robots. Life is not robotic. It's not black and white. So we had to sit up and pay attention to ourselves and our surroundings create meaningful rituals to keep us connected and sustain us, and get conscious in order to better navigate life and enjoy the ride. So I want to leave you with three takeaways to help you better navigate your well-being that Ayurveda and traditional Eastern philosophies like, tradi like traditional Chinese medicine already understand, that science is right now figuring out, which makes it easier for us, and that needs to hit the mainstream fast. One. My own one? No, I got behind. One, 
Mind, body, spirit. We're becoming more... No, one. (laughs) Mind, body, spirit. We're becoming more familiar with this phrase after hundreds of years of being obsessed by the physical only. What do I look like? How many sit-ups can I do? Ayurveda is all about the delicate balance of mind, body, spirit. Optimum health means all of these areas need love. So forget about burning calories and creating six packs. What we need to do is rebuild and ground our information overloaded, sleep deprived cells. Otherwise, we're just using up further resources. Anyone with kids here? You got an overtired kid? Do you swing them into a disco? Do you stuff them full of food and make them watch a horror movie and then expect them to sleep? That's what we do to ourselves. (laughs) Right? (laughs) And have a coffee while we're at it. So rather than hit a punch bag or a hit class, consider creating space in your life to slow down, to breathe, to connect. It's called yoga, by the way, or tai chi, or qigong, or mindful walking. Take care of your nervous system. Looking after your mental well-being is about so much more than Sudoku, which I never can pronounce Sudoku. Meditation has been used for thousands of years already to deal with stress, heal physical elements, and promote better sleep. It's now commonly used to treat mental health disorders, addiction, and PTSD, or post-traumatic stress disorder. It allows us to heal ourselves. I liken it to the practice of airing your dirty laundry in private, of processing your day's experiences so you don't process them onto somebody else. Our thoughts build our world, so make sure you clean your mental desktop as much as you clean your teeth. Trapped emotions and memories are a root cause of many of our everyday stresses and determine how we see and how we react to life. We've never been more technologically connected, yet spiritually disconnected. We need tribes and like-minded communities like us today to understand ourselves and others around us. Make time to connect with your true spirit, your essence, if you like, what makes you sing. Gut health. Two, oh, I'm going one, wrong. Gut health, the buzzword of the moment. We now understand that the long overlooked gut is more or less our second brain. Your gut houses 70% of the cells that make up your immune system, over 100 million brain cells, and 95% of your serotonin. This delicate environment that we take care of with how and when we eat, rather than only focusing on what. Ayurveda's got this. We call it Agni which means fire, the fire of digestion. A healthy fire metabolizes food into building blocks. It also processes our experiences and burns through undesirable food and experiences. In Ayurveda, the foundation of good health is a lively digestion, something we're just cottoning onto in the West. Why are we so behind? In fact, in Ayurveda, we say, this is my favorite, it's better to have good digestion and a bad diet than it is to have bad digestion and a good diet which totally turns everything that we know in the West on its head, right? So your meal can be organic. Ah, It can be biodynamic. It can be grown in the Dalai Lama's garden. It can be sprinkled with fairy dust, and it can be delivered by the angels, angel roo. But if you haven't got good digestion, if you're eating it when you're grumpy, stressed, angry, or completely oblivious to the fact you're even eating, which is quite often, I think, for some of us, then what should essentially be good for you becomes completely upsetting to your system. So, what can we do? Prepare. Ayurveda adds nature's medicine cabinet of herbs and spices to the meals we eat every day. Yeah, sure, they're tonics, they're they're remedies, they're preparations, but we can put a little bit, if often, into our food. Make sure you're hungry before you eat. Often we eat when we're bored, upset, anxious, because the clock's gone one, because someone's given us food, because we just walked past food. Don't snack all day. Leave time between meals for digestion to take place. Make lunch your main meal of the day. Eat light and early at night, except when you're partying at buff. So think lunch munch, light night, just like grandparents did when they had tea at 5 p.m. at night. Done. Drink warm to hot water and avoid cold drinks and, and uh, cold food and drinks, especially iced water, which completely dampens the agni. Anyone with any digestive issues, that's just rule 101. 
As we're coming into the festive period, chew on some raw ginger with lime 15 minutes before you've got to eat, right? So you've just had your buck spears and your bagels and your smoked salmon, and oh my goodness, now the turkey's on the table. So if you need to get your digestion fired up, a bit of ginger with lime, maybe a touch of salt, 15 minutes beforehand, and you can feel your mouth watering, your body responding. It makes all the difference. Oh, I forgot to click the clicker. Okay, three. Three. No, I've gone backwards, sorry. <laughs> I missed the middle one. Okay, two, cook. Yes, in an age where everyone thinks raw is the ultimate health food, there's a reason that cooking has become a, um, a part of the, human of, of the tradition of humans. When we cook food, we break it down. We essentially pre-digest it to make the nutrients easier to access. That's why we give cooked food to babies, to elderly, to anyone unwell. If we are not able to digest and absorb those nutrients, they just pass through us. Raw food can be very difficult to digest, and we're all knackered already. It's taxing on the body, and it can be very dampening to the agni. So go, go soups and stews and make these your repertoire. Oh, back again, one more, sorry. Present, be present, smell your food, eat slowly, chew well, taste and savor. If you're a foodie and you're just gobbling your food, you're not experiencing it. Tune in, the first mini burp or belch, which you can only get if you tune in, will tell you that you're reaching capacity. Be grateful and respect the process of your food, which will essentially become a part of you. Ancient cultures created rituals around food. When you ate, how you ate, what you did, and what process, digestives, aperitifs. They understood the importance of digestion. Us, we're just walking down the street, eating like this on a phone call, doing whatever. You know, we need to come back and respect that. Three, circadian rhythm, or the daily cycles of biological activity. Ayurveda encourages us to live with the rhythms of nature. We're essentially one big clock, and every cell in our body is a little clock. Our environment shapes us. It influence us, influences us. It sends us signals, just like the brain, just like the gut. And through epigenetics, we now understand that our environment and lifestyle can turn certain genes on or off. Ayurveda recognizes that there are better times to eat, sleep, work, rest, and play, where the energies of the natural world support those activities. So it makes sense to honor them, right, for an easier ride? But the modern world exposes us to so many artificial energies that upset our body clocks. Technology means that we are always on. Just imagine how much stimuli we receive in a day compared to our ancestors. Our nervous systems have not evolved to cope with this, so we have to create rituals to cut back. Talking of stimuli, artificial lighting is huge. Make sure you get out in the day and get sunlight in your face, on, in your eyes, for a good length of time. Let your body know it's daytime outside. Then at sundown, switch to amber lighting. Use a sunset mode on your phone and, do and download a similar app for your devices. One of the most overlooked health risks in today's world is chronic exposure to blue light, which suppresses the production of melatonin, our sleep hormone more than any other type of light. That can mean that while you might well fall asleep in the evening watching a box set in bed, the quality of your sleep is really impaired. Get some glasses designed to filter the blue light. Anyone want to talk to me about that afterwards? Really, really important. It will make the difference. It will help you to wind down at night. And then, as much as we're looking for nutrients from our environment, we need to be aware of reducing hormone-disrupting chemicals and avoiding toxic overload. We need to be aware of the quality of the food that we eat, the water we drink, the air we breathe, the products we put on our skin. Sounds obvious, but look for natural skincare and beauty. Get a water filter. Buy the best quality food you can afford. If you're living in the inner city environment or near any farms, get an air purifier. I've gone too fast again. Okay, um, back one, sorry. So overstimulation, artificial light, hormone disrupting. No, I wasn't actually, I was right. Overstimulation, artificial light, hormone disrupting chemicals. These are all forms of pollution which affect our body's natural rhythm and puts us into a state of stress, leaving us unable to function in a balanced way. So it's just our environment. This is the tree of life, by the way, but it's all chaotic. That's what that represents. By becoming rooted in the rhythms of nature, we automatically function in a more balanced way. So we have to ask for our environment to look after ourselves. Ayurveda provides the understanding and the rituals which we can incorporate into our day-to-day -to, -day to help us truly thrive and enjoy the journey. So to finish, it's up to us, I did these by the way, the people, to make a change by going back to a way of living that makes us a force of nature rather than a force against nature.
we can then find a way to take care of ourselves so we can take care of others. I believe that Ayurveda and other ancient philosophies of health hold the key to the future of our health and the health of our planet. We must demand a more nurturing and supportive way of life in our schools, in our workplace, in our homes, in order to reach our full potential, our inherent superpowers and abilities. We can use the platforms, digital or otherwise, that we have created. Our voices can be heard louder and clearer than ever, so let's use them. Just us being in this room right now, discussing this today, raises the collective consciousness. Our actions of collective consciousness improve our chances of getting it right. We can already see and feel the effects of this level of consciousness filtering through the rise, filtering through with the rise of ethical fashion and conscious consumer demand, of the resounding interest we now have in our planet and our own well-being. So even as one person, you can have a huge impact, because after all, as Rumi says, you are not a drop in the ocean, you are the entire ocean in a drop. So let's use technology with nature in mind. Let's create technology with nature in mind. When we work with nature, we work with ourselves. That is Ayurveda. Thank you. Thank you.